We are in Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah chapter 14, our last week in the book of Zechariah. Kind of sad, kind of sad to see Zach go. Um, but it's been good. I I just been enjoying this. This has been this has been pretty cool. As we've talked about over the last uh, <coughs> 14 weeks, the historical background to the book of Zechariah, the context is found in the book of Ezra. He lived during the time that Ezra writes about. He lived when the Jews had returned from Babylon and began to rebuild their temple. His prophecies were given over the years 520 to 518 B.C. That's 500 years before Jesus. And as we've talked about many times, one of the key distinctions to Zechariah is he's got a whole lot to say about the coming Messiah, more so than just about any other book in the Old Testament. You know, the books cover all kinds of subjects, but one of Zechariah's main uh, things is the Messiah. We're now in a section of Zechariah where he gives a series of prophecies that look far into his future. Chapters 9 through 11 talked about the first coming of Jesus, which is 500 years before his time. Chapters 12 through 14 mostly look towards the second coming, which is coming to a world near you at any moment. We're waiting for all the new movies to come out, you know, the, the, the Hobbit, and, and uh, I want to see Unbroken. I can hardly wait to see Unbroken. I, I know they've left some stuff out from the book, but you know what? I love Louis Zamperini. When that movie comes out on Christmas, we all ought to go watch it, you know? It, it's, uh, Louis Zamperini is an amazing, amazing story, a wonderful, awesome believer. And um, I know Angeline and Jolie left some of the parts about him coming to Christ at the Billy Graham crusade out. But I, I think we're going to still see the Lord present in the movie. I just have a uh, hoping. So, one last time, we're going to rev up the DeLorean. We're going to go back to our future. So buckle up your seatbelts and let's hit the road. Roads? Where we're going, we don't need roads. Okay, we won't hit the road. Okay, there you go. That's it. No more DeLoreans. Okay. Chapter 14, verse 1. The day of the Lord. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming. Literally, literally the day of Yahweh is coming. And your spoil will be divided in your midst. The day of the Lord... This is a time of judgment. This is spoken of throughout the Old Testament. It is not a 24-hour period. It is a period of time. It's a generic period of time covering, well, there's different packages of how we look at the day of the Lord. Um, but it's the time of judgment that culminates in the return of Jesus to this planet. He says in verse 1, Your spoil will be divided in your midst. The city of Jerusalem towards the end of the Battle of Armageddon, will actually be captured. The, the armies will have surrounded it, and it will be overrun for a short period of time. The spoils of the city will be divided among the nations that are attacking it. Verse 2, For I will gather all the nations to battle against Jerusalem. The city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished. Half of the city shall go into captivity, but the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Now, he talks about stuff like the house is rifled and the women ravished, raped. Kind of sounds kind of barbaric in our eyes nowadays. You know, if, 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 if U.S. soldiers were guilty of doing something like this, looting people's houses and, and raping women... You know, they would be court-martialed. They would be guilty of, of war crimes, is what we in our civilized world think. And you, and you read this and you think, well, it's just old stuff. You know, that, that ain't going to happen. Friends, it's happening. This is so today's news. Um, I could have used a bunch of different sources. I want to show you an, an interview with a fellow named Andrew White. He's an Anglican bishop. He's known as the vicar of Baghdad, or the bishop or the pastor of the church in Baghdad. He's a part of the Anglican church. He's going to speak a little bit with a 
British lisp with a little bit of a Middle Eastern twang to it. Um, and I warn you that the, the video has a little bit of crackling in the audio. I couldn't find a cleaner, a cleaner version of this. He has recently been evacuated from Baghdad and is now currently in Israel. But this is Andrew White. A few days later, another story of some of our young people. ISIS turned up and they said to the children, you say the words that you will follow mommy. And the children, all under 15, four of them, they said, no, we love you, sir. We have always loved you, sir. We have always followed you, sir. Your sir has always been with us. They said, say the word. I said, no, we can't. They chopped all their heads off. How do you respond to that? This guy's the real deal. He's the real deal. He was ordered out of Iraq by the Archbishop Bishop of Canterbury. He wanted to stay. He's talking about things that were going on in Mosul in northern Iraq when um, ISIS took over Mosul, um, chopping people's heads off. Here are a group of, of kids under age 15. Um, news reports tell us of the Islamic State not only beheading children, but but looting households, raping women, selling women and children into slavery. Um, it is like, you kind of wonder if this is Islamic nations surrounding Jerusalem when you look at the, the actions that are being done. Verse 3, Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. The Lord will go forth and fight. Jerusalem will be captured briefly, but then Jesus will return, and he will fight the battle. You know this passage from Revelation 19. This is the end of the book. In case you get really depressed in life, ever, oh, it's always go, go, go to the end of the book. Find out how it all turns out. This is how it all turns out. Revelation 19 says, now, John says, Now I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. He's not riding a black horse. Our king rides a white horse. And he who sat on him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. The armies of heaven, that's you and I, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. Do I? Yeah, I could. I could use some more amens. He's coming back. Amen. amen. I'm going to talk for a few minutes. I want to talk about God's fight because here God shows up and He will fight. But in thinking about this, I'm seeing that there's two kinds of battles. Some battles are my battles. There are some battles in life that I am responsible to fight. When Joshua led the armies of Israel into battle to conquer the land of Canaan, God spoke to him and said, No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with, you, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. But don't mistake this. Even though God was with them, Joshua had to fight. His armies had to take up the swords, the spears. They had to fight, literally fight the enemy. There are other battles in life, friends, that are God's battles. They are battles that God doesn't want you lifting a finger about. 
when Jehoshaphat was being invaded by Ammon, Moab, and Edom, a prophet spoke up and told them, Thus says the Lord to you, Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. And in this instance, they didn't lift up any swords. In fact, in this instance, in, in 2 Chronicles 20, um, Dave, they sent the worship leaders out in front of the army. And they led everybody in worship. And as they began to worship, God did the fighting and the enemies all killed each other. We get into trouble, friends, when we confuse these two, my battles and God's battles. Part of growing up in life is learning to distinguish the two. We get into trouble when we confuse these things. For example, temptation. What do I do? Which, which battle is temptation? Who's responsible to fight temptation? We, we, um, we ask people to pray for me. Pray, pray for me that I could be delivered from lust. You know, and I, and I hear churches, you know, cast out the demon of lust. I got news for you. There is no demon of lust. The lust is a little bit closer than some demon. The lust is in you. It's in you. And God, I, I, I'm sure God appreciates that you want to deal with the lust. But this is not God's battle. This is your battle. God will be with you just like Joshua. He will be with you in the battle. But you are going to have to pick up the sword. And you are going to have to fight. And if you expect God to remove the lust from you, you are going to be so sorely mistaken. And you're going to be so defeated because God's expecting you to take up the sword to, to do something about this. Um, in Colossians chapter 3, watch this. Colossians 3, 5, Paul writes... So put to death, this is him, he's telling us to do this. So put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. These are things that you have responsibility for. And, and if you... It's good if you want to come up and ask for prayer for it. Sure, that's awesome. That's a, good, that's a good thing. God wants to help you, but you are responsible to do something. Addictions are kind of in the same idea. You know, we, we say, well, God, deliver me from this. Well, at some point, you're going to have to do some action yourself. There are other situations where God wants you to keep you know, put the sword down and let him take care of it. Um, sometimes it's people, it's strange people that are in your life that give you such difficulties. Sometimes. And I'm only saying sometimes, because sometimes these sometimes you gotta pick up the sword with this too, but but sometimes it's these difficult people in your life. And you think that you have to fix somebody. This is my responsibility is to fix them. Well, Sometimes, that's not your job. Um, sometimes God would rather that you just shut up and let him handle it. Sometimes. May God give us the wisdom to know when the battle is ours and when the battle is his. When it says, God, the Lord went out and fought for them, that's one of his battles. We need to, we need to learn the difference. Verse 4. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall be moved toward the north and half of it toward the south. His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is an interesting study. I could talk for hours about the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives is this hill that's located just to the east of the Temple Mount. It's just right across like a little gully, right from it. There's the Mount of Olives. 
Uh, on Palm Sunday, Jesus rode donkey down the Mount of Olives. Before Jesus was crucified, he spent the evening, be- the evening before praying in a garden at the base of the Mount of Olives. When Jesus was ascending to heaven, the last place his feet were touching was the Mount of Olives. And here it says his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, and the Mount of Olives shall split. Now watch this. I spent a long time fixing this next graphic, okay? When Jesus stands on the Mount of Olives, the mountain splits, half goes to the north, and half goes to the south. Did you impressed? You want me to do it again? Want me to do it? Here, there it splits it, and then it splits. Patting myself on the back there. A new valley appears, one that will lead from the Temple Mount. The Temple, the temple will be re- rebuilt here, and it will lead straight down into the Dead Sea. Verse 5, then you shall flee through my mountain valley, for the mountain valley shall reach to Atzel. Yes, you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. Atzel, the name means reserve. Where is it? Heck, if we know. I, we, nobody knows where it is yet, so I won't try to pinpoint it. He mentions an earthquake in the days of Uzziah. This is something that took place 240 years before Zechariah. And yet it was a big enough deal that, that he's referencing this, like everybody ought to know about it. It was a huge earthquake. And he says, thus the Lord my God will come and all the saints with you. That's us. We will be arriving with Jesus. His robe will be stained with blood. Because he's the one doing all the fighting. You know this from his, from Isaiah 63. We, on the other hand, keep our robes white. Verse 6. It shall come to pass in that day that there will be no light. The lights will diminish. Isaiah writes, For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not give their light. The sun will be darkened in its going forth and the moon will not cause its light to shine. So it will get dark. Verse 7, it shall be one day which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time it shall happen that it will be light. Now, it sounds a little confusing. Is it going to be dark or is it going to be light? Some suggest that maybe, uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm skipping. Some suggest that maybe it's dark in the morning and it gets light at night. Could be. Another commentator says it's going to be some kind of a murky light. I don't know which. Verse 8, and it, in that day it shall be that living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and half of them toward the western sea. In both summer and winter it shall occur. Living waters shall flow from Jerusalem. Living water is a technical term. There's two kinds of water sources in Israel. Um, because it's in a desert, they go to great pains to save all of their rainwater. And they have these amazing systems of, of uh, drainage to pool all the rainwater in, a, in, a, in one place. And they store it in what's called a cistern. That's not living water. We call that dead water. Living water is water that comes from a spring bubbling up. And that's what he's describing. A spring will spring it. We talked about this last week. Um, it will come actually from the temple, from God's throne in the temple. Ezekiel 47 talks about that. And half of the water will flow through this new valley into the Dead Sea. We talked last week about how it will bring life to the Dead Sea. The other half of the water will flow into the Mediterranean. Verse 9, And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be the Lord is one and his name one. Now, in that day it shall be the Lord is one, or Yahweh is one, and his name one. The Lord is one is the great cry that identifies Judaism. Moses wrote in Isaiah 6, in, in Deuteronomy 6, 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is the great cry of the Jews. This is, this is what makes them Jewish, is that they believe that the Lord, Yahweh, is their God, and Yahweh is one, one God. We call it the unity of God. We believe that there are three persons in one God and don't ex- 
expect me to explain that because I can't. Um, but, but this is the center of Judaism. And when Jesus returns, the Jews won't be the only ones crying this. The entire planet will be crying this as well. This will not be something exclusive to the Jews because Jesus will be the king of the planet. Was it? Um, um, I still haven't seen Titanic, but you know, Leonard DiCaprio, I'm king of the world or something like that. Well, you know what? He ain't. Jesus will be the king of the world the king of the planet. Verse 10, All the land shall be turned into a plain from Geba to Rimmon south of Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall be raised up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate to the place of the first gate and the corner gate and from the tower of Hananel to the king's wine presses. Now it mentions Geba to Rimmon. Jerusalem sits in a line of hills that, spread, that stretches north and south inland of, of Israel between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. You can see it as, as we rotate the map. It, it's, there's a line of hills. And what he's describing is that Geba is to the north of Jerusalem, Rimmon is to the south. And the idea is that everything on all these hills is going to be flattened and Israel will be a plain, one level, same altitude, country and Jerusalem will be lifted up above everything. This is what he's describing. And then he mentions all these places and, and, and it will be inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate to all this stuff. All the places listed all the place all the places listed are to show that this city will go back to being just what it's supposed to be. Everything will be back to normal since they had been conquered. Verse eleven. The people shall dwell in it. And no longer shall there be utter destruction, but Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. And this shall be the plague with which the Lord will strike all the people who fought against Jerusalem. Here it gets really good. Pay attention. It really gets really good here. Their flesh shall dissolve while they stand on their feet. Their eyes shall dissolve in their sockets and their tongues will dissolve in their mouths. I have a video. (laughs) Now I'll warn you, you know me, you might need to cover your eyes. Yeah, get get ready parents, get ready to cover their eyes. It's pretty scary. That's a chocolate bunny. So now you have an idea of what's going to happen. Verse 13. It shall come to pass in that day that a great panic from the Lord will be among them. Everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise his hand against his neighbor's hand. Judah also will fight at Jerusalem. So the whole nation is involved. And the wealth of all the surrounding nations shall be gathered together Gold, silver, and apparel in great abundance. The wealth of the surrounding nations. So even though they had plundered is Jerusalem at the beginning, now they are plundered. So they, the, the, uh, Israel gets it all back. Verse 15. Such also shall be the plague on the horse and the mule, on the camel and the donkey, and on all the cattle that will be in those camps. So shall this plague be. So now it mentions the horse, the mule, camels, donkeys. They too will melt. (laughs) Some have suggested that maybe Zachariah is talking about what could be something like a neutron bomb. 
where um, the, the, the buildings are intact, but the people are not. Could be something like that. It says, this shall be the plague. We talk about being on the right side. Because friends, Jesus is coming back. And you're going to be on one of two sides. You're going to be on God's side, or you're not going to be on God's side. You, there's no, no other choices. You're either with him or against him. Jesus said, he who is not with me is against me. So, when he comes back, whose side are you going to be on? No, there will be no more time to play games. There's no, no way to talk yourself out of it. How do you get on the good side? How do you get on the right side? Well, I've got to tell you, it's not by being good enough. God knows that you will never be good enough. I could never be good enough. That's why God sent His Son to die for us. He sent Him to die to pay for our sins. And all God is looking for you to do is to turn to Him and ask for help. He's tur- he wants you to turn to Him and trust Him. Jesus said that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever would believe in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. Whose side are you on? That can change today. That can change today. Verse 16 calling this next section Millennium. The Millennium is the thousand-year reign of Jesus on this earth. After he comes back, he will rule and reign on this planet for a thousand years. Verse 16, And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Now it talks about everyone who's left. Well, who is left? At this point in history, there will be two types of human beings on this planet. There will be those of us who got raptured before the tribulation. We'll have the glorified new and improved bodies. Those are the ones that can disappear. They can change their appearance. They can fly. I mean, we're just going to have the biggest blast in the world. The glorified body is going to be very, very cool. We, we, we love it. But there will be another type of human on the world, in the planet, And that will be those that during the tribulation will have finally realized that they needed Jesus. And they will somehow have escaped being beheaded, which is another interesting thing too, isn't it? Because the the Bible talks about the reign of the Antichrist beheading people who don't believe. And who in the world has ever heard of that? Well, now we have, haven't we? Um, And there will be people who will have survived in their old bodies. And it's, these, and it's from these people with the old bodies, those who have survived, there will be nations of these people, and they will send representatives every year to Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem will be the de facto capital of the world. Jesus will rule and reign this planet from Jerusalem. And it says they will send people to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles was set up to remind Israel back of the day, back to the time when God had delivered them out of Egypt. That's another movie coming out. I don't know, I don't know how that one's going to turn out. I don't know. Um, I hope it'll be better than that Noah thing. I never saw the Noah thing, but don't see the Noah thing. Okay. Um, i got to get out more. I don't see any of these movies, right? I... I, uh, I didn't miss anything? Okay, okay, okay. Well, let's not talk about movies. We go on for an hour's fair. The Feast of Tabernacles takes us back to the day when God took them out of Egypt and they lived for 40 years in the wilderness living in tents. The fancy word for tent is tabernacle. So you could say to your honey, honey, this weekend can we go out tabernacling? And she'll look at you and go, huh? So you can impress you can impress each other with this these fancy words, the feast of tabernacles. You would go out once. A, uh, the, the idea of the Jewish feast is once a year. You would take your family and you go live out in the patio or go out camping. You live in well, tents, or they would make lean, they make these lean tos out of palm branches and all like that to remember the days when they lived in tabernacles. But it was also a day when God lived with them. 
Because there was a tent that they built in the wilderness for God. God's presence. We call that tent the tabernacle. We, call his, we don't call him as his thing, the tent, because it's, we make it more fancy. It's the, the tabernacle. When Jesus returns, the Feast of Tabernacles is the premier Jewish feast that the whole world will celebrate. Why? Because he will be with us. God will literally be with us, tabernacling with us. Verse 17, And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations and do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, which is no rain. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So the idea is that, is that any nation that stops sending representatives to Jerusalem to celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, God will shut off the rain. Kind of sounds like, California. It'll, it'll, it will think back and we'll go, yeah, I remember that day. when we, Okay, verse 20. In that day, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. The pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them and cook in them. In that day there shall be no longer uh, there shall no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of hosts. No, there shall no longer be a Canaanite. The Canaanites, to me, are the epitome of the ungodly. When Israel came out of Egypt and God gave them this promised land, they were supposed to conquer and wipe out the Canaanites because these are like the most horribly wicked people that were ever, that ever were. They didn't quite exactly do that. Well, there will be a day when God will be done with the ungodly. They will be gone. He will remove them. Not till Jesus returns. And I want to just end on this last phrase. In that day, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses. Now, this is fascinating. Everybody's gonna, everything in Jerusalem is going to have this engraving, holiness to the Lord. The Jewish high priest had a unique set of clothing. He's the only one who would wear this apparel. And one of the things, what he wore on his head, he would wear a turban that had a gold plate attached to it up at the top. And written on that, inscribed on that gold plate, well, we're told in Exodus, you shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it, like the engraving of a signet, holiness to the Lord. That was a unique thing. That was a high priest thing. So that once a year when the high priest comes into God's presence, he had written across his head, holiness to the Lord. And yet now, after Jesus returns, even the bells of the horses have holiness to the Lord. Last lesson I want to talk about is this. God's goal is holiness. God's goal is holiness. This is the end of the picture. This is what God comes to do. This is the outcome of his return, is holiness. Pots, pans, even the horses will be called holy. Holiness, I think one of the little things we can hang our hat on, holiness is about purity about being different than the world. It's being separate from sin. It's about purity. It speaks of being right with God. And when, and when Jesus returns, the Canaanites are gone. Everything immoral, impure will be gone. And everything will be marked by holiness. Holiness. That's God's ultimate goal for you. This is God's, this sounds hokey, but this is God's wish for you. This is God's hope for you, is holiness. Peter writes, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, and he's quoting from Leviticus, 
Be holy, for I am holy. This is what God wants for His people. He's never stopped wanting it. This is God's desire for me. This is God's desire for you, is purity. To sin less. Some of us have the mistaken idea that achieving holiness is how we get God to love us. And or, and or maybe we think that's how I get Him to give me things. You know, if I could just be a little better, maybe He'd answer my prayers. You know what? I got news for you. He already is madly in love with you. This, is, this doesn't change how He loves you. He already loves you. You, you, you can't get him to love you more than he already does. I want to show you a little short video and then I'll tell you the picture I'm trying to paint. it on. A message from the foundation for a better life. Now, I don't, I don't want to talk about patience. <laughs> I got something bigger to talk about. Because if you were that child's grandfather and you're the one smoothing out the concrete, what, did you stop loving him? Because he messed up your work? Are you kidding me? Now, I know some of you have had parents that that's exactly how they operate. But I got news for you. That is so screwed up. That's not right. In reality, there's no way a grandfather's going to stop loving a little grandson like that because he walked in the cement. But I got to tell you, the grandfather will teach the grandchild to not walk in the cement. Right? Just because you love him doesn't mean you go, well, then let's just have a big cement party. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so. God wants us to learn holiness, friends, because it's what's best for us. You are operate better. Your life goes better when we learn holiness. It's not about being better than other people. Some of us have this goofy idea that, you know, well, I, I don't want my friends to think I'm a snob or something. Well, then you got the wrong idea of holiness. There's nobody more holy than Jesus. Jesus wasn't a snob. Jesus was humble. Jesus was loving. Holiness isn't about being better than people. And if you think because you stopped eating chocolate for one whole day that you can look down your nose at your friend and say, oh, I stopped chocolate for a day. You're an idiot. <laughs> it's not about being better than other people. It's about, and you know I'm not really talking about chocolate. You do know that, don't you? You take out chocolate, put in a blank, and you fill in your problem. God wants us to learn holiness because it's what's best for us. It's about, it's what, what being a grown-up Christian is about, is growing in holiness. Sometimes we quit trying because all we can do is think about how we fail. And, and, and we just think, well, I'll never make it. John writes in 1 John 3, See how very much our Father loves us, for He calls us His children, and that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know Him. Dear friends, we are already God's children, 
but he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears, but we do know that we will be like him, for we will see him as he really is. And all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure, just as he is pure. You know, friends, instead of thinking about how many times you failed, work at thinking about Jesus at who he is, at the fact that there's going to be a day you're going to see him face to face. And I'm not going to try to shame you into thinking that, well, you're going to be so embarrassed because you're such a jerk. No, 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 no. No, that's the wrong motivation. I have a longing I want to honor him. You know, when I get to heaven and everything is totally holy and pure, I don't want to be, I don't want to have like a, you know, at the beginning of the year, they do those polar bear swims where these guys go jump in these really cold lakes and stuff like that. I don't want to have that kind of a shock to my system. Oh, is this what it's like? No, no, no. I, I, I want to go, whew, finally. A fellow named Arden K. Barden. Arden Barden. Who would name their kid Arden Barden? I don't know. But this person wrote this. It's not the way we deal with our human situation that is the basis for hope, as in, I have hope because I'm doing a good job in this life. Hope is the basis for how we deal with our human situation. That's what John's talking about. It's our hope in the soon return of Jesus that gives us the strength to keep going, to keep changing, to keep fighting the fight, to keep swimming against the current of this world. Yesterday we had a guest speaker at our men's breakfast. It was an awesome thing. It was a wonderful time. Nathan Muldoon was, was his name, is his name, was his name. He's not dead, he's still alive. At least he was yesterday. Um, Young man, married, God, what, what do you say, two-year-old uh, kid? He's a distance swimmer. He does these incredibly ridiculous long swims. Like on Mondays, he goes out in the ocean, he swims for nine hours. Sick, 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 sick. <laughs> He's one of these people who's swam to Catalina. And what he told us about was his time that he swam the English Channel. Absolutely fascinating. Spellbound. At one point I was thinking, did you die? (laughs) But I knew that was kind of an idiot question because he's standing there in front of us, you know. He talked about the difficulties he faced as he swam. He he started his swim in the middle of the night. It was 2 a.m. when he when he set out from Dover in England. And he talked about being disoriented in the dark. And and even though he's swam in the dark before, for this some reason. This time it would just totally add him com- discombobulated. And you know, they've got a boat trailing them, you know, that's helping guide them and telling them how, how to swim and all, but they can't touch the boat. And so we talked about, about being disoriented. At one point, the winds picked up in the channel between England and France. The winds picked up. He's swimming through three foot swells, trying to keep from swallowing too much water as he swims. Um, the current picks up. And its currents go in the wrong direction. Um, um, he's a couple of miles off of the coast of France, and he's realizing that he's losing ground. France keeps looking like it's getting farther and farther away instead of closer and closer. He's nine hours into his swim, and the people on the boat are talking and chatting, and, and the pilot of the boat says, for an hour, you've got to sprint. He's already been swimming for nine hours you got to sprint for an hour. And so he picks up the pace and he's swimming harder and harder. At the end of the hour, they say, his dad says, you've got to sprint for another hour. And so he goes, okay. And he's swimming harder and harder and harder. And then they say at the end of that hour, Nathan, you've got to sprint for one more hour. Um, The team prayed for the wind to calm. And God actually answered that prayer. 
And finally the wind and the currents changed and began to make progress. He swam for 15 hours, he said, and he made it. My friends, you have to keep going. Life is a marathon swim. And failing once or twice or Let's be honest, two or three hundred times. Don't stop. Don't settle. Don't settle for going with the current. Just keep sprinting another hour. Just go another hour. Don't quit. Don't quit. Because friends, one day he will indeed come. He will come. And we will see him face to face. That's going to be a good day, isn't it? Oh my goodness, it's going to be a good day. What a day that will be. Let's stand and let's pray. Father, I, I do understand that it's very possible that right here today there might be some of our friends with us that when we talk about whose side are we on, we would have to admit that we're on the wrong side right now and that we are not with Jesus. Friend, it's not that hard to switch sides. The Bible talks about Jesus knocking at the door of our hearts. He wants to be a part of your life. He wants to come into your life. But you have to say yes. You have to invite Him in. Let today be the day that you stop fighting Him. Let today be the day that you say to Him something very simple like this. Dear God, I have screwed things up and I need you. Would you forgive me? Would you love me? Would you come into my life? Would you help me as I choose to follow you? And I thank you for hearing my prayer. And Lord, I pray for my beloved friends here. All of us who struggle with holiness. Lord, help us to walk another hour. Help us not to quit. Help us to move a little bit in the right direction. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.